I, uh, I want to deep, deeply breathe because what you've seen here this morning has to do with the identity of these young people. What they're saying is, look, I want to identify with you. I want to identify with Christ in his death, his burial, his resurrection. That's a big deal. And it's kind of an odd way of doing this with a bunch of water in a tank and so on. But nonetheless, that's what the Bible says we should do as a mark of our identity. And for some of you, this may be the first time that you've ever seen something like this. So after a delightful time of celebrating what God's doing in the lives of a bunch of young people, they gave me this topic in the Family Matters series. Identity, sex, and gender. Let's pray and be dismissed. (laughs) Oh. You know, last week, Josue described marriage. Uh, We talked a couple weeks ago about what kids should expect from their parents. You know, last week we found out from Josue that during the 25 years of their marriage, coming up on 25 years anyway, that the biggest debate they've ever had has been how to squeeze the toothpaste tube. Nonetheless, what uh, what a delightful reminder about the importance and significance and sanctity of marriage. I actually, I consider this to be a real privilege. Um, I want to be gentle today, but I want to be direct. We are in chaos on this identity thing. I'm a, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. I, I don't know what a woman is. How do we use restrooms? How do we assign people to different sports teams? Truth matters. And the question we ask today about this issue is, what does God say? I mean, he knows it all. He sees it all. He has a purpose in it all. And frankly, I don't trust my own view of myself. I like to think I know who I am and all that kind of stuff, but somebody reminded me the other day that self-awareness is awful. You know, when you really find out who you are, it's just, it's terrifying along the way. But we are all created in God's image. We'll come to a scripture passage on that. I I know that. We are all, I don't just believe it, I know it. We are all created in God's image. In contrast to every other living thing, you are not a cat, you are not a dog, you are not a horse, you're not a tree. And by the way, Don't take your behavior on this issue of sex and gender from animals. You know that some of them are cannibals. Others of them eat their young. Don't take your cues from animals. And unfortunately, we got this guy, you know, a few years ago who came up with this idea that uh, we are all, you know, coming into existence as a result of this progression of evolution that, you know, we humans are just simply highly developed offspring of some, you know, cosmic burp or primordial soup or whatever it might be. And we have blurred those lines to the point that we no longer recognize that we as human beings, every human being is made in the image of God. It does not matter your sex. It does not matter your race. It does not matter your view of God. It does not matter whether you're LGBTQ plus whatever it is. You are human and you are made in the image of God. Unfortunately, in our world today, we have uh, come up with this sort of equation. Who am I equals what I feel. Now, who am I is a good question. It's one of the four basic questions. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Who am I? Where am I going? Who am I is a big deal. But when we let it be determined by how we're feeling, we are succumbing to deceitful uh, 
answers. I think there are two seasons in life when we are particularly vulnerable to the lies about who I am. One is puberty and the other is midlife. I've been through both, at least the second one. (laughs) And so when it comes to identifying who we are, it's really important for us to go back if we really believe in the truth. Truth matters and your source of truth, I'd be willing to discuss that with you uh, if we have a little bit of time anyway. What is your source for truth? Is it what God says? Or is it what we think or what culture says it is or what the vote is or what government says it is? And unfortunately, we are guilty of just extreme idolatry. We, I'm including myself here, we are guilty of idolatry when we become so arrogant that we think I decide who I am. That's idolatry in the very, very root meaning. It's idolatry. I cannot determine what's best for me. I cannot determine what's best for you. And when we deny, and I'm preaching here, okay. When we deny our genetic or biological or physical reality using surgery or hormones or whatever it might be, we're bowing down at the altar of experience and we're saying what I feel is who I am. And that's not true. So we think we're autonomous. We think that we are engaged in self-rule. Who I am and what I feel is, is is, is integral to each other. So let's just dive into what the Bible has to say, okay? First, let's quote a contemporary author on this particular subject by the name of Rosaria Butterfield, who says this, the idol of our historical epoch is this. In other words, today's cultural idol is this. This is what we're bowing down to. Your sexual desires define you, determine you, and should always delight you. That's what our culture is saying. And that is so wrong. Our identity is explained in the Bible, as far as God is concerned, I'm gonna approach it from three directions. Number one, as a human being, number two, as a Christian, and, and number, two, uh, number three, sexually. As a human being, now I'm, we're gonna put these verses up on the screen, but I want you to look at them in your own, if you've got a paper Bible, you know, you can underline verses if you have a, a, a smart Bible or a Bible on your smart device. You can highlight it, I don't know how to do that, but I've heard you can. You can underline it somewhere along the way. I want you to look up these verses, Genesis 1, 27. Genesis, it's easy to find, it's early in the Bible, it's right there at the beginning. Genesis chapter one, verse 27, describes God's creation of this universe. And he creates this universe in six days, and on the sixth day, he comes to the very epitome of creation where he creates man in our image, in our likeness, and gives us some duties, mankind. Verse uh, 27, so God created, this is an important verse, it is so important that God repeats it several times in the Bible. If you missed it in Genesis, you'll get it later on. If you missed it in Matthew, you get it in Mark. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You know, the first two lines seem a bit redundant. So God created mankind in his own image. And if you didn't get that, here it is again. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Couple of things pretty obvious in this particular passage. And again, repeated throughout scripture. We're made in the image of God. We are made male and female. And 
for those of you who follow all the terminology going on, that's, that's binary, okay? I understand the word binary. Now, in our world today, we are, we are believing and we're following this idea that it's all within you. It's all within you. You can be whatever you want to be. You determine your own destiny. And when you follow that track, it is so overwhelming. And I believe that particularly, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put this in one category, okay? I think it's particularly difficult for young women when you think that you're supposed to be whatever you can be and do whatever you can do because it's all within you. And then we forget the fact that as these students reminded, reminded us of, that God is behind it and he's underneath it and he's the one who gives us value. And I know we have a sin nature and I know we sin and Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And just before that passage, Paul goes into great detail. He's, he says, look, there's a, you, you just can't get out of it. I mean, it's bad. It's really bad. But I want you to understand this. It is not our environment that dictates who we are. Now, I understand that environment is important and it does affect some of what we are, but it is not our environment that dictates who we are. I may have an absent father, I may have a domineering mother, I may have past trauma somewhere in my life, I may have had bad parenting, I may be highly influenced by social media, but it is not my environment that dictates who I am. Illustration. God with pride and joy, creates the first kids. You know, after he created Adam, he said, it's good. It wasn't until he created Eve that he said, it's very good. <laughs> I agree with him. Isn't that nice? I agree with you, God. <laughs> and the first chance his kids had to rebel, they did in a perfect environment. And then grandson number one kills grandson number two. It's still a matter of the grace of God, it still is. As a human being, we're all made in the image of God. In fact, the Bible says, that's why you don't damn anybody because they're made in the image of God. In the book of James, we're reminded of that. Now, as a Christian, as a Christian, let's just shift gears a little bit. Those who are followers of Jesus, we use a lot of terms to describe a person who's a Christian. We call it being saved. We call it being born again. We call it being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus, being a child of God, being a disciple of Christ. However you want to describe it as a Christian, here's what the Bible says about us. Turn to uh, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter five, Pastor Ty preached on this just a few weeks ago. 2 Corinthians chapter five, great, great reconciliation passage. 2 Corinthians, it's way back in there. In my Bible, it's page 1137, which will not help you at all. 2 Corinthians chapter five and verse 17. If you are in Christ, this is what the Bible says about these students who were baptized this morning who shared their testimony. Here's what it says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Wow. New creation. Turn uh, back a couple more books to the book of Ephesians. So you've got 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter one. I think one of these verses was read a little bit earlier. Ephesians chapter one and verse four. 
For God chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight in love. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Before the creation of the world, before Genesis 1-1 started, God put his finger on you. Now that is incredible. Turn over to chapter two of Ephesians, and there are many, many more verses. I'm just touching the surface. Ephesians chapter two and verse 10. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. For we are God's workmanship. Again, every one of these students, everybody here who proclaims the name of Jesus is God's workmanship. That word uh, used in Paul's day, in his language, is our word, poem. You're God's poem. Creativity. Turn over to first, first Peter's a little harder to find. Maybe go to the book of Revelation and thumb back a few pages. First Peter, chapter two, and verse nine. It's as if, you know, God is saying through the apostle, to, through the apostle Peter, to you, he's saying, look folks, you are a chosen people. This is verse nine of chapter two. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's who you are. Blows my mind. And by the way, our identity is not wrapped up just in what we believe, which is sort of the easy thing. I can check the boxes and you know, so on along the way, but in how we behave. I mean, we are here to declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. As a human being, I'm made in the image of God. As a Christian, I'm chosen by him. I'm a part of his creative work. Now the delicate part, sexually. You know, the Bible identifies all kinds of sexual sin, bestiality and polygamy and adultery and incest and homosexuality and lust and so on. All of them are clearly identified as sinful behavior. There's no question. You can't, you can't twist the verses in any other way than to conclude these are sinful behavior. And then, then our friend Sigmund Freud, a few years ago, said that our identity is all wrapped up in sex. And that's just who we are. That is not so. Now there are seasons of life where you think it is, okay? But that's not so. And then we come down to this whole dynamic as, 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 as Christians, as, as the church, as people who follow the Bible, who follow what God says, they would say that, and we would say that the, that the perfect sexual standard is for men to be attracted to women and women attracted to men. But let me tell you, it's more than that. It's more than that. In fact, I would state it very clearly. God's design is that sex happen only between one man and one woman in the relationship that the Bible calls marriage. It's not what the government calls it, it's what the Bible calls it. And we've had on two occasions, Dr. Christopher Yuan, who's far more 
gifted at communicating these kinds of truths than I am. He's been in that world. And he has defined what we would call, or what he calls, holy sexuality. And I like this biblical standard for everybody. Here's his quote. Holy sexuality is chastity and singleness and faithfulness in marriage. That's, that's biblical. I want you to turn back to the middle of your Bibles, the book of Isaiah. Isaiah. <clears throat> Isaiah, kind of the middle of the book. Isaiah 45, middle of Isaiah. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 45, verse 9. Woe to him who quarrels with his maker. To him who is but a potsherd among the potsherds on the ground. You know, a potsherd is just a piece of broken pottery, just a piece of dirt, a piece of clay. And you have the potsherds on the ground complaining to the maker. Last part of verse 9 Does the clay say to the potter, What are you making? Does your work say, He has no hands? This is all satirical, okay? Understand. Verse 10. Woe to him who says to his father, why have you begotten? Or to his mother, why, what have you brought to birth? In other words, the piece of clay that is molded into a piece of great pottery does not complain to its maker. So we as human beings do not complain to the maker and say, why did you make me like this? By the way, that's repeated in Romans, lest you think that's just an Old Testament concept, in Romans chapter nine. Great, great passage about God's sovereignty in Romans chapter nine says this. <clears throat> and verse 20. Who are you? Let me, let me contemporize that. Basically, Paul is saying, you idiot. You idiot, you're talking back to God? Last part of verse 20, shall what is formed say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? Oh, by the way, this has to do with more than just sexual issues. You ever complained about how God made you? You ever look in the mirror and say, why do I have this nose and these ears and this hair or no hair? Why don't complain to your maker? And our culture says, I want such and such and, and, and that's gonna make me happy and that's my goal in life. And, and, and you know what the Bible says? The Bible says as command number 10, if you covet someone, that's a sin. If you covet something, that's a sin. And it's a sin of the mind. It's not just a sin of the action. It doesn't mean that you go and steal it. That's another command about that. But if you, if you covet something someone else has, that is a violation of God's clear command. I want to be like so-and-so. I don't like what I am. So let me give you, with that sort of biblical background, let me give you what I would consider to be four or five just practical points for families. I really believe that what kids need most from parents is to help them establish their identity, biblical identity. First of all, 
Give them a high view of God's intelligent design. Give your kids, parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, give your kids a high view of God's intelligent design. Repeat and review what God says. I I need to read this passage because you need to have this passage marked in your Bible from Psalm 139. David says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Took nine months. Next verse. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You need to reinforce what God did when he designed your kids. Lee gave me permission to tell this story. My wife, Lee, gave me permission to tell the story. As a young girl, she was facing changes in her world, in her personal world. And it was frustrating her so much that she basically just sort of cried out, I don't want to be a girl. I don't want to be a girl. Mom heard about it first and then sent her to dad. (laughs) Go talk to your dad. And you know what he did? He sat her down and said, honey, yeah, right now it just seems kind of tough. Changes are happening. They're hard to explain. I can't even explain them. But someday you'll be blessed as a woman. There are advantages to being a woman. And he articulated some of them. To this day, Lee has made a wonderful woman. Lousy man. Parents, you need to reinforce God's intelligent, loving design of your kids. Number two, be consistent. Be consistent. It's easy for parents to change their views based on the behavior of their children or the choices of their children. No, don't do that. Don't do that. That's not what they need. I'm I'm afraid and I'm... I'm stepping off the edge of the platform here at this point, but let me meddle for just a moment. The use of the pronouns, you know, we've got these preferred pronoun kinds of things that are going on today. There's an element whereby when I use a pronoun to describe someone who claims to be a woman but is a man, I'm lying. Now, there's there's a dynamic whereby as parents, and listen, I... Folks, we're all touched by this. If you haven't been touched, you're not getting out very much at all. We're all touched by this, and it hurts. And it's not fun just to take a Bible and bash somebody over the head with it like this. Not at all. But it hurts. And you struggle with how in the world do I respond? And that whole issue of consistency, biblical consistency is very important. The third thing I mentioned is this. As parents, balance truth and compassion. Balance truth and compassion. You know, there are times when our kids need more truth, and then there are times when our kids need more compassion, and as parents, you need to sort of determine which is which and what they need most at the time, but don't leave out either one. There's a phrase that goes around that I struggle with a lot, and it's that little phrase, and I heard it described here just again recently. We just need to love. 
Now, I agree with that phrase as long as you take out the word just. We need to love. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad that our, that our motto here at Calvary, our sort of our publicity model is, is, motto is live to love, not just live to love or live to just love because God's love involves truth and every so often truth has to include some tough stuff. And if I think that it's my purpose to maintain a relationship with my kids for my entire life, I don't want to lose them before I get a chance to share the gospel with them. You know, that's, that's an often a, a voiced goal, but it's a little skewed because we as parents think we, ha- think we have to maintain relationships at all costs. No. No, you don't sacrifice the truth to maintain a relationship. And you know, the Bible says that it doesn't matter if you gain the whole world, but lose your own soul. Balance truth and compassion. Oh, that's hard. Number number four, teach and model biblical masculinity and femininity. And those are... Those are topics for another time. We'll have Josue speak on that. (laughs) But number five, lean into transformation. This is our hope, folks. This is our hope. The gospel is transforming. There's a sense in which the gospel is harsh. Jesus is, is divisive, he's divisive. And the gospel includes repentance, which means change. It means turning. It's, it's, it's part of the gospel. The gospel does not allow me to be a follower of Jesus and be comfortable in my sinful habits. And the laws that are out there that say, well, you can't, you, you can't counsel a kid to you know, change his view on gender, you know, transgender issues or whatever it might be, and, or... Um, Recently, our, but just last week, uh, we have a granddaughter who attends the University of Iowa. She's not a Christian. No, she is a Christian. She is a Christian. That was supposed to be a joke. It did not go very well, okay? <clears throat> Iowa didn't play yesterday. We don't have to worry about it, all right? And she was going to a speech given by a person who was involved in detransition, detransitioning. She had thought she wanted to be a man and started to do the hormones and started to do the surgeries and so on and then realized this is not right. And so she gave a speech telling her story. And as our granddaughter wanted to go, she was met by dozens and dozens of people who were shouting profanities and holding up signs basically keeping her from going into the, into the lecture. And she just turned around and began to weep. And the sadness of it all was, why have we come to this point where we don't believe in hope anymore? And if anybody does, they're to be cursed. I guess I put it this way, and look, look folks, I, I'm a, this is not an easy subject. You all know it. Can't even laugh at my jokes. Nonetheless, I guess maybe the spirit I ought to have is, I want to meet you where you are. I don't approve. Because sometimes when we tell somebody we want to meet them where they are, we're approving, we're endorsing their behavior. No, we're not. I want to meet you where you are. I don't approve, but I want to show you something of God's incredible grace and mercy. Our identity. God-given identity. Lord, I know, I know it's really hard. We live in a world which just, it just, 
it's a struggle for me to see how confused we are about something that seems to me to be very simple and very uh, clear in the scriptures. And, and God, I, I may have said wrong things this morning or been misunderstood and I apologize for that. But God, most of all, I want to be able to speak the truth in love because that is our hope. And our hope is for transformation. And our hope is for change to align with what you say about us, not with what we think or feel. God, I also know my conversations with all kinds of people that this issue, particularly on the sexual identity issue, is affecting so many of us today. Help us, Lord, to know your direction your guidance, your wisdom, as we deal with the issue in our own personal lives and the lives of those we meet. Most of all, Lord, thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand, please?